Ohio State first up. They are 15 point favorites and it's floating. That number's floated from 14 and a half to 16. They're on the road. They're at Nebraska. Uh, Nebraska pound for pound is probably the most underrated team at the power five level. When you take a ranking versus power rating perspective, there's a big gap. Ryan Day knows it. Ryan Day at Ohio State this week has tried to preach as much as he can. I do not care that this team's sub 500. It's a good team. What he's seeing is he's seeing past the record. That old context in college football we talk so much about. What he's watching is that Michigan film. That top 10 Michigan team, Nebraska pushed him to the limit. He's watching that Michigan State film. Nebraska versus Michigan State. Michigan State right now in the top four. Nebraska pushed him to the very limit. And he's also watching him play Oklahoma. Another top 10 team right now, undefeated. Nebraska pushed him to the very limit. See, Nebraska is a couple of bounces away here and there from being right in the thick of this. But instead, they're sub 500. And they're out of every contention-based metric. They're good. I'm just telling you, they're a lot better team. And Ryan Day knows it. Their offensive line at Ohio State played good enough to win the other night against Penn State. Nothing to write home about, though, when it comes to the Buckeye standard. Nothing to write home about. It is a classic situation where, of course, the coaching staff knows. The coaching staff hopes they've hammered it home to their team enough to know we cannot be going in here and sleepwalking. This is not any time for experimentation. This is not a time to figure some things out. This is not a time to pad anyone's stats. It's going to be a knife fight if you allow it. That's why a fast start's really important. There are a couple of games here we're about to break down, this being one of them, where it's imperative that you don't allow that crowd to believe early. Because if Ohio State allows even a Knicks worth of blood in the water earlier, it's going four quarters. Uh, Nebraska is good enough to hang in there. And if you give them a couple of breaks, then that crowd and that team at home, they're good enough to kick the rest of the thing down themselves. So I'm going to take Ohio State to win this game. The, the model thinks the number's just about right. It's above two touchdowns in terms of point spread. I'm going to go Nebraska plus the points. I will go Ohio State to win. I think we'll know a lot by about the 10-minute mark in the second quarter. If Ohio State's already settled in and they have established that early lead and it's Nebraska trying to play keep up, that's one thing. But if there's been an early turnover and then there's been another couple of throws down the field against that Ohio State secondary, uh, they got a guy out in the first half. And so defensively, if there's some weaknesses and Nebraska pops you early, four quarters, it's going four quarters. Most football games do. It's just sometimes they're out of reach in the fourth quarter. That one I think may go four quarters. LSU is at Alabama. And I'm a little depressed here. I'm a little depressed because, well, it's not noteworthy. We didn't even do an LSU Alabama individual video breakdown. Why? Bama's favored by 28 and a half, which is about the same point spread that existed on this game last year. And remember last year, it was one of our biggest best bets of the year. Think about that. Bama laying, I think, 29 last year. And yet we said it's still nowhere close. Uh, and it was bad. It was violent. It was terrible. What they did to LSU last year, straight up NC-17 rated beatdown. So now the game's in Tuscaloosa. There's another fat point spread on this thing. I'm very interested to watch this, not because of the outcome being in doubt, but I'm very interested to watch what Alabama is coming out of the bye week. I'm a believer that whatever they're going to be offensively, you're going to see it Saturday. I mean, there is, like I said with Ohio State, this is no more time for experimentation. You're not trying anything else out. This is November. You are who you're going to be as a team. When you come out of that bye week, positioned where it is for Alabama, and you're in November, if they've decided that we're not going to try and rotate receivers in there, we've identified three or four and we're going to ride them, this is where you'll see it. If they're tired of seeing Jaleel Billingsley be somewhat of a liability at times at tight end, they want to ride Latu and they want to be more physical in the run game, this is where you'll see it. My point is, if they want to inject more tempo and they trust Bryce Young more coming out of the bite, this is where you'll see it. A lot of people think, oh, they'll save some stuff for Auburn. They'll save some stuff for the SEC championship game. That's not how real football works especially when you have no margin for error. That's not how it works. So I'm looking at this, and I, I see 17 and a half right now is the first half line. And if you'll notice, the regular line on this thing is 28 and a half. Well, what Vegas is doing is they're not going to allow a repeat of last year where folks just killed them betting Bama first half because they knew a fast start was coming. I still think Bama first half here is worth something, so much so that I may look at it Saturday morning I don't want to lay the hook above 17. Now, I want 17 or less, uh, but the model thinks Bama's rolling LSU. They think Bama by, I think, 33. So we're taking Bama to win, even at 28 and a half. We're taking Bama to cover. Um, 
I still think there's a lot of residue, even from two years ago. And it's funny that this is not a program, this Alabama program, historically, they are not a program that thrives on that disrespect and fuel for motivation being, you know, you doing something to them. The one exception, not that they needed it, but the one exception has been the way LSU carried themselves in their building two years ago. I was there. I was in, I was, I was one wall away from Ed Orgeron when he was being filmed secretly in the LSU locker room. I was on the field with him before that. So I experienced all that. Now, what I didn't know is I didn't know that everyone was going to be able to experience it because someone was, you know, live streaming in the LSU locker room. So I knew what was happening in there, uh, but I hear that stuff a lot. That's standard procedure. When you're on the road and you win a game like that, go crazy. I don't care what you do. You earned the right. You won the game. But it got out. And Ed Orgeron said some things that uh, he has not been able to back up since then. And this is Ed's last trip to Tuscaloosa. And, um, you know, we've had Nick Saban on the show a couple of times. And so he's a friend of the program. I think we're ready to say it. And one thing about Nick Saban is if he can reach into your chest and pull your heart out and hold it above his team while the blood trickles down, and that is your last experience against the University of Alabama, he'll do it, and they're going to do it Saturday, I do believe. Moving on, Georgia Tech plays Miami Saturday. I want to put a bright red emergency light on this game because I think it is a Huge upset alert game that no one's talking about. As I say that, Miami Hurricane fans think I'm crazy because Miami's been playing really good football. Tyler Van Dyke is the answer at quarterback. I've seen it, guys. I've been following it. We've been talking about Miami. Here's the problem. I do this about one or two times a year. I did it last year, and we nailed it. And I'm telling you, this is one of those games I've got a bad feeling about turnovers. I got a bad feeling. And here's where it usually happens. It's usually a very specialized situation where a backup quarterback gets hot, like Tyler Van Dyke is right now, and then you start getting further and further into the backup's tenure, and there's a game that comes up where, I mean, you're feeling great. If you're Miami right now, you're looking at Georgia Tech and your mouth's watering because you think not only do we get to go back home in warm weather instead of playing in Pittsburgh in late October, we got Georgia Tech, they are beleaguered, they're coming in here, so we'll be able to run it up a little bit on them. And what happens is you get a little loose and you put the ball in a few too many places it shouldn't be, and you get a couple of balls that otherwise would have been tucked away and run for, you get them batted at the line of scrimmage and they fall into enemy hands. I've got a feeling that Georgia Tech is gonna be allowed to hang around in this game a lot more. Number one, because I think turnovers could be an issue. We never predict turnovers. I do it like once or twice a year. I think Miami's gonna be minus in turnovers on Saturday, that's one. Number two, Miami, when you've watched them, even in this run, I really think Georgia Tech will be able to run the ball enough on Miami to where if you combine that, if I take that and I combine it with turnover problems, I think they'll be able to hang in the game. Because, I mean, I think Georgia, really in the air, I think Georgia Tech in the air will be able to make enough plays here. Not overwhelm them, but make enough plays in the air here to where I think they're going to hang. The model by the slimmest of margins does have Miami winning the game. But Georgia Tech's one of our best bets of the week. So we're taking the Jackets plus nine and a half is what we got it at. Right now it's at ten and a half. So, hey, if you can get that, by all means take it. No, we did get ten and a half. That's right. I thought it had dropped to nine and a half. So we got ten and a half earlier in the week. Uh, we like Miami to win closer maybe than the experts think. Moving on, Tennessee. Director Collins nervous about this game. Nervous. And I can tell you, Tennessee folks have been ready for this one for a little while. Tennessee's at Kentucky. Kentucky opened as a favorite. It's right at pick right now. Kentucky just lost, okay? So so people are a little bit off that that blue bandwagon. Kentucky goes to Mississippi State and they lose. They had bad turnover issues in their own right. And so I remember, man, talking to some people around the Tennessee program, look, they knew when they were coming out of that Ole Miss game and they had to go to Tuscaloosa and play Alabama, I mean, they, they didn't have any grand illusions about going in there and pulling the upset of the century. It would have been nice, but they were looking at getting to the bye week, getting healthy, and this Kentucky game. That's what Tennessee folks have been ready for because this is one that's going to do a lot more to tell them where they're at than playing Georgia or playing Alabama. And so here we go. On the surface, there's a lot to like about Tennessee here. I was going to pick Tennessee. I mean, I was really ready to pick Tennessee. A lot of you were, apparently, because this line's moved all the way down to pick from Kentucky minus like two. 
But the more I get into it a little bit, I'm not so sure I love the matchup for Tennessee. I'm looking, and the reason why I've watched Kentucky lose a couple of games, number one's been because of turnovers. They've won some games in spite of turnovers, to be honest with you. But they've had teams that could stall them on the ground. Now, I don't know that Tennessee's equipped to do that. So if Kentucky, A, rectifies turnovers, which should be a, an emphasis in every sense of the word this week because of what happened last week, and B, they have more success on the ground, which they should against Tennessee, and C, it's going to be like 15 degrees, not quite, but it's going to be really cold. They get back home. I think it's a more Kentucky dictate the terms kind of game. Back and forth, don't think it's a blowout either way. Certainly don't think it's a blowout. I think Kentucky's going to end up winning the game here. As much as I wanted to be on Tennessee coming out of that bye and finishing strong, I actually think Kentucky's going to win the game. We're going to make it one of our best bets later in the show. We're going to add it to the Ramen Noodle Express. I'm not particularly happy to say it because this is one where the model is telling me something I'm not crazy about hearing. Kentucky folks already think I hate them. So why not lean into it at this point? But I don't. Trust me, I don't. And we themed the entire set blue. And C, I'm picking you to win the game. How about Baylor at TCU? Very important game here. Uh, a lot rides on where we will be a week from Saturday based on the outcome of this game. Baylor is favored by six and a half to seven, depending on where you look. They're on the road at TCU. TCU has lost five of the last six. Team's a mess. They just fired Gary Patterson, so he's out the door. Everything's against TCU, and yet that line with top 15 Baylor is under a touchdown. And so what do we make of this? Well, you got Oklahoma next week. That's what I'm talking about when I say a lot rides on where we'll be. Because I'd love to be at McLean Stadium next week for Oklahoma at Baylor. And that would be the biggest matchup of the week next week. But here's the problem. I think a lot of people at Baylor are aware of that too, and they got a hurdle right here. And it does not ever tell you what to expect when a coach is fired. Everyone thinks coach is fired, program in disarray, it's an automatic play against. How's that working out for you with Washington State? Like, Rolovich was gone, and then Washington State covers, and everyone's, I can't believe this. Football players know how to play the game by this point of the season. Like, they don't need a guy to tell them, all right now, now I'm going to put you in, I'm going to put you at receiver. So what I want you to do is when they snap that ball, I want you to run as fast as you can until you get 15 yards downfield. And I want you to turn in, someone's going to throw the ball to you. No one needs to be taught that at this point. So a head coach, they're making some in-game decisions, but they got Jerry Kiln at TCU. He's been a head coach. So it's not like it's a massive downgrade over a four-quarter sample size. TCU could win this game. The model loves TCU. The model thinks TCU's got upset, outright potential. I'm not going that far because I love the way Dave Aranda is able to manage his team. Uh, Baylor, I think now and moving forward, as long as he's there, I don't think they're going to be a team of extreme highs and extreme lows. I think they mirror his personality. And so I think they'll be able to go in there, and I do expect them to be able to win the game. I don't think it's going to be without sweat and maybe some fingernails chewed to the nubs late, but I do like Baylor to win. I don't really have any opinions strongly one way or the other on the spread there. Uh, two other games that we're not going to break down. I just want you to keep an eye on them. Oregon's going to Washington, and also Michigan State's going to Purdue. And these are games where you've got top 10 teams. Michigan State is favored by three at Purdue. Oregon's favored by seven at Washington. I'm just telling you, like these are games that they're not on your radar until they are. And all of a sudden, your buddy texts you, and it's midway through the third quarter, and it's tied, and you're saying, when are they going to pull away? And they don't, because really neither of these offenses probably is built, if they're in one of those, we call them slog fests. If they're in a slog fest, they're not going to pull away. I mean, there's a reason why these numbers are as low as they are. Pay attention to Michigan State Saturday. They got Ohio State the week after. I mean, they, they got Ohio State two weeks after. They see it on the horizon. They see it coming. None of these games are a gimme. Michigan State can win every one of them, but none of them is a gimme. And Oregon, likewise, that offense has not been built and not been able to just pull away from inferior teams out there. That's how the likes of Stanford end up coming up and biting you. So just keep an eye. Michigan State, Oregon, there are a lot of teams this Saturday that are highly ranked but not highly favored. And that's a recipe for Upset City. There you see Oregon's schedule there. Uh, Oregon, listen, they, they still got to go to Utah on the 20th. May have to play them again, for all I know, in the Pac-12 championship game. I mean, that's not easy now. Oregon's still got some tasks ahead of them. And there's one, obviously, this Saturday. Now, listen, Oregon, 
you guys, I hope you do well athletically because it's been well established this week. You'll never measure up academically. Shame. Because if there's one thing that we watch for on Saturdays, it's the GPA. That's all I'm watching for. If you win the football game, whatever. I want to see you at the academic decathlon on a Monday morning. That's what I want to see. That's why we love this sport so much. Not the best of weeks for Jimmy Lake. 